Um, I will talk a little bit about rehabilitation models that are important uh, for the pharmacotherapy of sex offenders. I will talk a little bit about risk assessment and diagnostic procedures that uh, we need when we want to treat sex offenders with uh, pharmacotherapy. I will talk about selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and other non hormonal agents, about testosterone lowering agents, about treatment algorithms, and uh, then I will come to some conclusions and make some recommendations and we'll talk a little bit about future plans. So, I think you will have heard about uh, the two major uh, rehabilitation models that have been used during the last 20 years. Um, one is the uh, risk-need responsivity model by Anderson Bonta. Um, I think most of you will know that uh, therapy should um, made with respect to the risk need responsivity principles. The risk principle means that uh, the risk po potential of the single offender for committing new offenses, um, uh, it means that the higher the risk, the more intensive the therapy should be. The need principle means that uh, the specific criminogenic needs should be considered uh, when um, th as therapy goals are selected. And uh, the responsivity principle means that we should use therapeutic programs to which the offender responds. For example, uh, patients with lower intelligence need other programs than, for example, high intelligence psychopathic uh, offenders. And then there's a second uh, rehabilitation model that became uh, more popular during the last, I think, five years, uh, that is the Good Lives model uh, proposed by Tony Ward, uh, which has a primary interest in enhancing the offense well-being, uh, but not uh, ignoring the risk. And both of these uh, models uh, have been used as a basis of, uh, for cognitive behavioral therapies, but also for pharmacotherapy interven for pharmacotherapeutic interventions. So, um, the next table shows uh, the uh, major risk factors for general criminal behavior um, that uh, Bonta and Andrews uh, wrote together in a paper in 2007. Um, you see three factors that uh, mainly have to do with uh, antisocial uh, patterns or antisocial personality characteristics. And then uh, the factor substance use, um, and then other factors like family, marital relationships, school, work uh, factors, and pro social recreational activities. And I think for pharmacological interventions, um, impulsivity may be um, the criminogenic need most important in uh, these general risk factors. Uh, of offenders. Um, when it comes to risk factors of uh, sex offenders, there are some special risk factors. Um, for example, um, intimacy deficits uh, like emotional congruence with children, which is especially important in uh, child molesters or child abusers, um, or hostility towards women. Um, and there are some, uh, some general risk factors that are also important uh, in violent offenders. But um, I think most important uh, in terms of pharmacological interventions is uh, the uh, risk factor sexual deviance. So um, there are sexual preference of children, sexual violence, multiple paraphilias. But uh, I think the most important um, aspect in sexual deviance is sexual uh, preoccupations. Um, sexual preoccupation um, may be more 
uh, or pharmacological agents may be more able um, to address uh, sexual preoccupation than uh, sexual deviance. For example, most of the studies that uh, looked at this point found no changes in sexual interest by pharmacological agents or through pharmacological agents, but uh, uh, in sexual preoccupation. So uh, Carl Hansen um, defines uh, sexual preoccupation as recurrent sexual thoughts and behavior that are not directed to a current romantic partner. The degree of casual or impersonal sexual activity may interfere with other pro-social goals or be perceived as intrusive or excessive by the offender. However, high levels of sexual preoccupation should be considered problematic even if the offender sees little wrong with his behavior. And also included in this category are offenders who are continually struggling to control their sexual thoughts or activities. For example, offenders who view all sexuality as sinful or to be completely avoided. <coughs> we looked at um, different studies and um, in most of the studies that had a larger, investigated larger uh, sex offender samples, we found um, a very similar number of sexual preoccupied uh, clients, which uh, in this uh, dynamic supervision project of Hansen, for example, uh, is around 11%. Um, uh, that show um, a high grade of uh, sexual preoccupation or sex drive, and there are another 30% that uh, show um, hints to uh, sexual preoccupation. And there are around 14% that uh, use sex as a coping strategy. And um, in uh, another sample that we investigated from Vienna, for example, we found nearly the, the, nearly the same numbers. And also in our samples, it's always around 10 to 20% that are highly uh, sexual preoccupied. So, um, a thorough uh, diagnostic and prognostic uh, assessment with respect to the principles of R&R should be the first step uh, for a medical treatment of sex offenders. And um, we should specify the risk, the risk for which offense, uh, for which period of time. We should determine um, dynamic risk factors and protective factors as well. And we should specify psychiatric uh, diagnosis if there is one. And then we should connect the scientific knowledge uh, with the data of the individual case and uh, make an individual treatment plan to, with uh, listing interventions to reduce risk factors and to increase protective factors with the treatment support, supervision control and changes in the social situation. Um, we use for risk assessment the uh, static 99 for static risk factors like previous uh, criminal offenses or age or um, marital status. And uh, then we use the STABLE 2007 and the ACUTE to um, assess the dynamic or changeable factors. Um, as you might know, the uh, STABLE 2007 includes, uh, for example, sexual preoccupation or using sex as coping strategy or um, sexual deviance. And we also used the instrument um, from the Netherlands, the SAPROF. I think uh, there are a lot of um, activities also here at this conference about the SAPROF uh, standardized assessment of protective factors. And one of the factors included there is also medication, which could uh, serve as a uh, protective factor. When it comes to um, Psychiatric diagnosis, there are three more or less trivial but important facts. Um, many sex offenders do not have a diagnosis or receive a diagnosis of a paraphilia, for example, a pedophilia or sexual sadism. Um, many patients with paraphilias are not sexual offenders and are not at risk 
of offending and many sexual offenders have relevant and treatable psychiatric diagnosis uh, or disorders that may have influence on the risk of offending. Um, I don't want to go through the uh, uh, new criteria of the DSM-5, uh, which are out since um, May of this year, uh, but just uh, brought uh, with me the uh, criteria of the uh, pedophilic disorder. Uh, I think there has uh, nothing changed uh, except the name uh, from pedophilia to pedophilic disorder, but uh, the criteria are nearly the same than uh, they were in the DSM-4TR. So over a period of at least six months, uh, recurrent intense sexual arousing fantasies, urges or behaviors involving sexual activity with a prepubescent child or children, uh, individual has acted on these urges, all the sexual urges or fantasies cause marked distress, um, and the individual is at least 16 years old or five years older than the child or children criterion A, and then there's the exclusive type and the non-exclusive type. Um, there are a lot of uh, other relevant uh, disorders in sex offenders. They have a high psychiatric morbidity or comorbidity, uh, substance use uh, problems like alcohol abuse in 60 to 85 percent, then mood disorders, especially dysthemia and depressive episodes in uh, about 60 percent, then a high uh, number of anxiety disorders, especially in pedophiles, uh, social phobia is a, uh, a problem, impulse control disorders, then uh, there were some studies that looked at attention deficit hyperactivity disorder retrospectively um, and found uh, around 30 percent. And then the paraphilias uh, and the personality disorders, most prominent uh, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder and avoidant personality disorder. And um, since uh, since uh, sexual fantasies or sexual preoccupation uh, and behaviors could be a form of uh, coping with negative mood states like depression or anxiety, um, the, uh, the uh, assessment, the investigation of the psychiatric disorders and also the treatment of these disorders uh, might be useful um, and relevant in terms of risk reduction. So, what are the medications that, uh, that can be used? Um, we can use the SSRIs or other non-hormonal agents and testosterone-lowering agents like cyprotorone, acetate and GnRH agonists. Um, what is the rationale to use the serotonin reuptake inhibitors? Um, Serotonin is uh, the main neurotransmitter that is associated with impulsivity in the sense of impaired behavior control, uh, behavior inhibition, and maybe more important, uh, the correlation of alterations uh, of the serotonin system in patients with impaired effect regulation. Um, because, as I said before, it turned out that some patients with affective and anxiety disorders use sexual stimulation to overcome the negative effects. So they use uh, sex as a coping strategy um, and uh, uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have, be, have been used uh, to uh, treat depression and anxiety disorders for now, I think, uh, more than 20 years. Um, and uh, they also have been used to um, treat uh, paraphilic patients and uh, compulsive sexual uh, disorder patients. The uh, possible mechanisms of uh, SSRI treatment is a general inhibition of sexual activity. Um, most of you might know that uh, SSRI treatment causes uh, sexual dysfunctions uh, in depressed patients or in uh, patients with anxiety disorders. A reduction of impulsiveness, a, re a relief of underlying depressive symptoms or anxiety disorders, and also maybe an indirect reduction of testosterone um, serum levels. But uh, up to now, there are only studies with a small sample size, around 50 or 60, 
uh, without any control groups um, and without uh, recidivism with sex offending as an outcome criterion. <laughs> Uh, there is only one placebo-controlled study that investigated homo and bisexual men, uh, which was made by Weinberg in 2006, published, I think. Um, but uh, these were um, men that did not uh, uh, show sexual offending behavior, but only um, hypersexual or compulsive sexual behavior. So, um, other non harmful agents, um, mood stabilizers have been used for example, lamotrigine um, and uh, also atypical antipsychotics, uh, for example, risperidone. Um, maybe if Jelle Trölster from Utrecht uh, is here, no he's not here, I think he did some work on uh, the use of risperidone uh, with uh, patients uh, from the autism spectrum disorder uh, together with the sexual offending behavior um, but there are also uh, case studies with patients uh, that show bipolar spectrum disorder disorders. Uh, Martin Kafka from Harvard did uh, a small case series um, where he used um, psychostimulants, uh, methylphenidate in patients with paraphilias and uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, I think the uh, diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder then um, uh, must be very well obtained because uh, psychostimulants could also uh, push one into uh, uh, hypersexual um, symptomatology. And then uh, naltrexone has been used. Uh, there are some studies from Nancy Raymond from uh, Minnesota and uh, some studies from Ryback. Um, Ryback investigated uh, adolescent sex offenders uh, and treated them with naltrexone in a doses between uh, 50 to 150 milligrams. Um, the hypothesized mechanism is an endogenous opiate receptor blockade an accumulation of antigenous opioids and inhibition of a dopamine release and um, I think maybe it's uh, worth trying um, to uh, treat patients with a paraphilic or hypersexual uh, disorder symptomatology and with a comorbid uh, substance abuse disorder because uh, naltrexone has also been used to treat uh, patients with uh, substance disorders. Um, why uh, use uh, testosterone lowering agents? I think most of you will know that uh, testosterone is necessary for sexual desire and sexual drive and the uh, substances that have been used are cyproterone acetate uh, which is called Androcur I think also in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Belgium um, Medroxyprogesterone acetate uh, both can be given oral or as depot injections and then the gonadotropine hormone, releasing hormone agonists like tryptorelin or luprolide that uh, are administered intramuscular or as a depot subcutaneous. Um, Cyclodrone acetate acts directly on the androgen receptors, blocks intracellular testosterone up uptake and intracellular metabolism of the androgen. So uh, this is the cyberterone and that's where it blocks at the receptor um, and uh, sexual fantasies, urges, sexual drive, um, erections, spermatogenes, all decrease in dose related. Uh, response uh, under cure or cyclone as that has been used for more than 40 years now um, in Europe. The uh, mode of action of the GnRH agonist is an exhaustion of hypothalamic pituitary <coughs> access by overstimulation. Uh, normally it's uh, a pulsatile action and uh, this overstimulation leads to an inhibition of gonadotropin uh, secretion and then testosterone. It may be more effective uh, than cyclorone acetate and uh, it is a pharmacological equivalent of surgical castration with uh, uh, a testosterone decreased to um, 
tests us to, uh, to uh, the castration levels, so below 50 or below 20, um, except uh, it is reversible, um, not like surgery castration. There are long-acting uh, injections um, that could be given monthly or three monthly. Here's an interesting study which was published in uh, 2009 in the uh, Journal of Sexual Medicine. It's interesting because uh, patients that were hypersexual uh, but not sexual offending were investigated and what you can see here is uh, a decrease of uh, sexual attempts, of sexual interest and sexual drive uh, in the period of uh, of 12 months and uh, also a strong decrease in testosterone um, and I just put a, a picture of uh, the first study that we did uh, with the GNRH agonist and sex offenders and you see there's nearly the same uh, decrease um, in sexual drive, sexual interest, sexual fantasies um, during a period of uh, around one year. All of these medications have uh, side effects. The side effects from this study uh, are, for example, heart flashes, uh, but also injection at the uh, uh, pain at the injection site. Uh, weight increase is a major problem. Uh, back pain, asthenia. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, so there are a lot of um, uh, adverse events or side effects. Um, in uh, the long-term uh, treatment, uh, side effects like thromboembolism, um, diabetes, hypertension, uh, adipositas, but also um, infertility um, may occur. And uh, the major problem is uh, the decrease in bone mineral density uh, with an increased factor risk. Um, so there are a lot of patients that, uh, if you treat them longer than three, four, or five years, um, that have uh, osteoporosis. Um, ten years ago, we proposed uh, the first uh, treatment algorithm um, uh, for the pharmacological treatment of paraphilias, and uh, this treatment algorithm. Uh, already respected the R&R criteria, I think, well. Um, we uh, recommended SSRI treatment uh, as first-line treatment for mild paraphilic patients without hands-on delinquency, um, then cyproterone acetate for those with a moderate risk um, of hands-on delinquency. Uh, and the GNRH agonists for those patients with compliance problems um, and with the most uh, severe uh, delinquency, so for example sadistic or pedophilic um, patients that have a high risk for hands-on uh, offenses and always in combination with uh, specific psychotherapy and if there is depression or anxiety then also a combination of uh, uh, testosterone-lowering medications with the SSRI uh, treatment. Um, in 2010, uh, Florence Thibault from France, uh, together with uh, some colleagues, uh, proposed these guidelines of the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry for the biological treatment of paraphilias. And everybody that is interested in this topic should, uh, I think, read this paper. It's a very strong literature review. And um, i just go to the uh, recommendations. This algorithm has uh, six levels now, so it's a little bit more differentiated. Um, the level, the first level, uh, the aim of the first level is uh, to control uh, paraphilic sexual fantasies, compulsions and behavior without an impact on conventional sexual activity and sexual desire and um, the therapeutic approach is psychotherapy. Then level two, um, the aim is uh, 
to control paraphilic fantasies with minor impact on conventional sexual activity um, and should be used in mild cases with hands of uh, paraphilias, for example, uh, exhibitionism. And uh, this is uh, the level where they recommend uh, treatment with SSRIs in a uh, usual doses like fluoxetine, 40 to 60 milligram. Then level three, uh, the aim is to control the paraphilic sexual fantasies with a moderate reduction of uh, conventional sexual activity and sexual desire. Uh, hands-on paraphilics with fondling but without penetration mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no sexual sadism I think this is important and uh, they then uh, add a low dose of uh, anti androgens to the SSRIs so cyclotron acetate for example 50 to 100 milligrams and SSRI medication and then level four um, it causes substanti substantial reduction of uh, sexual activity and desire in patients with a high risk of sexual violence, so severe paraphilias. Um, they use uh, full doses of uh, cyclotron acetate, so that means 200 to 300 milligrams per day, uh, or the intramuscular uh, application. But still, these are patients where no sexual uh, sadism. Um, is prominent and then the last two levels um, the aim is to control um, paraphilic uh, fantasies and uh, leads to almost a complete suppression of sexual desire and activity in high-risk um, sexual offenders also with sexual sadism and uh, at this stage they use long-acting GnRH agonists like triptyrolene or luprolide um, they recommend testosterone uh, level measurements uh, on a regular basis and uh, for the first month because there can be a flare-up effect they recommend um, cyclotron acetate uh, medication plus the uh, GnRH uh, agonist medication. And the last level is uh, complete suppression of sexual desire and, and activity with cyclotron acetate uh, it's a, a, a maximum doses and GnRH agonists. Um, so this is uh, the uh, these are the guidelines of the um, uh, of the WFSBP, um, which are I think uh, state of the art at the moment. Um, to uh, monitor, um, one should. Uh, look uh, every th three to six months to, at a blood pressure, weight um, and depression, emotional disturbances uh, every six months, uh, the glucose levels of calcium and phosphate um, and every year I think uh, or every two years um, osteodensitometry should be obtained to look at osteoporosis and uh, as I said before, testosterone blood levels could be checked in in a case of uh, risk of breaks in the therapy. To further help with uh, treatment selection, um, Bill Maletsky from the US uh, has proposed the uh, De Provera scale. Um, this scale uh, recommends uh, uh, testosterone lowering medication for all offenders with three or more factors or two or more start factors or with a score exceeding six. Um, so there are factors like multiple victims, multiple paraphilias, preferential deviant sexuality, uh, deviant sexual interest by a or able screen, something that is not uh, used in, in Germany. Um, uh, but also any male victim, CNS dysfunction is, uh, I think, a, a, a very important point. Uh, and then sexual violations while under community supervision, sexual violations in an institution um, or history of sexual offender treatment failures. And um, we made a small survey where we asked um, uh, experts, heads of forensic psychiatric um, hospitals, 
um, to rate the importance of the items of the De Povera scale. Um, and uh, they said that a treatment failure or violations under community supervision, violations in an institute and use of force and sexual crime, uh, these are the most important um, points that um, uh, they found most important in the uh, in the Valesky scale. We um, did a uh, recent recently did an uh, observational study um, where we evaluated, evaluated the frequency uh, of the prescription of testosterone lowering medications in. Um, more than 30 German forensic psychiatric hospitals uh, with uh, around 4,000 patients, uh, 600 of them being sex offenders. And uh, all patients were treated psychotherapeutically uh, in this, these forensic psychiatric hospitals. Um, around 11% received SSRI treatment, 10% uh, GnRH uh, uh, treatment, 10% antipsychotics and 5% um, received uh, cyclotron acetate. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of side effects that were reported. For example, 30% uh, uh, pain at the side of the injection or bone mineral density loss. 40% in the group uh, of the GnRH agonist treated patients. Um, you see that there are. Um, no patients that were uh, in the cyberterone acetate group. I think it's just because they were, they uh, they didn't measure that. Uh, I think there should be not such a such a difference. <clears throat> so um, what do we know about effectiveness or efficacy? I'm sorry that this is a, a German slide, but uh, this is a meta-analysis by Lösel and Schmucker. Uh, which also included German studies and um, also included studies that used medication and uh, everything that is below one uh, uh, is uh, effective. Uh, there is a risk reduction with this uh, therapy and you see here the first bar, a cognitive behavioral psychotherapy and behavioral psychotherapy. Uh, this is the number of studies that were included so 35 studies were included with, uh, that used cognitive behavioral therapy. And there are also uh, hormonal agents, six studies were included. However, uh, these are only uh, studies that used medroxyprogesterone acetate, which we don't have in Europe. Um, and uh, the uh, control group um, and the medication group, uh, they are not really comparable. Uh, but uh, as you can see here, there are no studies on GnRH agonist or cyclotrone acetate um, that uh, used control groups or classic randomized control design. Um, from another uh, meta-analysis that Carl Hansen published uh, and that most of you might know, um, we know that uh, if the uh, uh, treatment uh, adhere to the R and R principles, then they are most effective. So, if they um, use all three R and R principles, then they are more effective. Uh, if they do not use any of the principles, they are ineffective. So, I think, especially uh, sexual preoccupation, um, is uh, a, a useful criminogenic need. Um, to treat with medications. Um, it should be noticed that um, even under a testosterone lowering medications there are non-responders. This is one of our first studies that uh, looked at uh, the differences between cyclotrone acetate and GnRH agonists and uh, there were no effects in 10 to 17 uh, patients and in the uh, new study that I uh, that we published uh, this year, they're near, nearly the same uh, numbers. So there are non-responders. Um, sometimes it's uh, because there are, for example, granulomas at the injection <coughs> sites. Sometimes you don't know why it happens and why the testosterone doesn't decrease and you have to change the medication. Um, and uh, in some patients, 
uh, they, they counteract uh, against the um, testosterone decrease and in some patients uh, testosterone does not have a does not play a role or, or a sexual preoccupation does not play a role um, so um, medication uh, is not a solution for everything. I had uh, two patients that recidivated under GnRH agonists uh, and were at the castration level. So, um, some conclusions and recommendations. We don't have evidence-based criteria from randomized controlled trials. Um, I think that uh, diagnostic evaluation and evidence-based treatment of uh, non-paraphilic psychiatric morbidity would be desirable also for non-clinical and prison settings, not only in forensic psychiatric hospital. It may be that uh, the positive reports that we have about the SSRI treatments result from their efficacy on non-paraphilic symptoms um, so, uh, or on, on side effects. Uh, but there's also a problem with these side effects on sexuality. Uh, for example, sexual dysfunctions um, could lead to an increased use of uh, paraphilic uh, fantasies. For example, if um, uh, the uh, patients have problems to reach orgasm, then they uh, can uh, use more intensive uh, paraphilic fantasies to reach orgasm. Um, if there are so many problems uh, and risks, especially for the testosterone lowering agents, then uh, where are the benefits? Um, I think if a person has a moderate to high risk uh, paraphilic disorder and the condition represents a significant risk of serious harm to his health or to the physical or moral integrity of other persons, um, and if no less intrusive treatment means of providing care are available, so if psychotherapy alone seems not sufficient and patients are um, preoccupied with uncontrollable sexual fantasies and urges, so you cannot um, uh, work with them only with psychotherapy, if there are indicators uh, for sadism and if there are severe problems with impulse control because of their neuropsychological or neuropsychiatric conditions, um, then uh, such a medication might be useful. Mm. From an um, ethical point of view, um, testosterone lowering medications should um, always be administered under free informed consent uh, given without pressure or belief that medication alone will affect uh, prison or a parolee always with a respect to the human right of not to be ill-treated, uh, the privacy and the right to procreate. Um, Ray and uh, Harrison uh, wrote a good uh, chapter about that and uh, Karen Harrison just published a book about ethical aspects in sex offender treatment, which is, I think, a really good book. Um, it should be part of a treatment plan that includes all other possible and necessary interventions like psychotherapy and should include a rational weighting of possible risks and benefits that may change fundamentally over time, so stay flexible and monitor regularly. Um, I think um, practically the, uh, the best uh, way to treat patients with testosterone-lowering agents is an interdisciplinary team uh, of a urologist, a bone specialist, and a psychiatrist or a sexologist. Um, if possible, then uh, you should start uh, testosterone lowering medication at the latest about 6 to 12 months before release because um, there are a lot of uh, negative reactions that uh, can happen, for example, narcissistic crisis or depression or frustration or. Uh, attempts to counterbalance uh, male identity with aggressive behavior. Um, if you start such a medication in an outpatient treatment, then um, a safe environment is important. Uh, sometimes it's useful uh, to start treatment um, in an inpatient uh, psychiatric treatment. Um, and if there's a uh, problem with uh, compliance, then the medication may have 
some advantages compared to other medications. Um, up to now, we do not know uh, something about the long-term consequences of GnRH agonists or salbutamol acetate administration in paraphilic uh, patients. But uh, from a clinical perspective, in most of the patients that are older than uh, 35 years, uh, weight gain, the metabolic syndrome, and osteoporosis is a, uh, is a, is a major problem and uh, can lead to um, to the aspect that you have to stop uh, medication um, after a longer period and I think uh, one should have to keep that in mind, should keep that in mind before starting treatment um, because it means something totally different if uh, you have to stop or interrupt medication in a patient that is uh, treated uh, um, in a locked ward or somebody who's on probation or um, is an outpatient. So, what are our future plans? Um, I'm glad that uh, I, I had to talk about state of the art and not about news uh, because we're planning this study for now, than, for now more than three years, I think. Uh, we, we published the study protocol, but nothing more. Um, we want to do a double-blind controlled clinical trial um, uh, to look at the efficacy of uh, psychotherapy combined with uh, GnRH agonists. Um, and uh, this shall be a multi-center lockboard based uh, a double-blind controlled uh, trial. So this, this is the major problem that we want to treat patients that uh, are treated in a forensic psychiatric hospital and uh, the uh, German Drug Administration and the Ethics Committee, we're not sure if uh, we can do that uh, for legal aspects and for ethical aspects. Uh, but uh, convicted sexual, sexual, sexual offenders uh, shall be randomized to receive psychotherapy together either with a tryptorine or a placebo and uh, the planned endpoints uh, are is, uh, is the uh, stable 2007 sexual preoccupation and also the multifaceted sex inventory uh, and the total sexual outlet by uh, Kinsey the modifi modified form and uh, for objective measures we want to use um, an eye tracking system uh, together with uh, colleagues from um, Göttingen. The sample size will be defined by the present feasibility, but uh, we plan to include uh, 20 uh, patients per arm. And uh, yeah, this is the design. I hope uh, if I come uh, to this conference during the next years, I can have, uh, I can present some good results uh, for the moment. I thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you. <clears throat>